Um, my name is Nimrod Roman, and uh, I've been a bad parent, and I just recently realized that, and I'll explain why in a moment. But first of all, just a quick intro, I've been two years an entrepreneur, and after that horribly failed, uh, I had the great luxury and opportunity of living vicariously through my startup clients at uh, Yigal Arnon & Co., which is where I've been working for the past 10 years. Yigal Arnon is a full-service full uh, firm representing both corporate entities, real estate clients, big litigation clients. But for me, my experience has been representing startups. We do a lot of investor representation. We do a lot of acquirer side representation. And we've been working with our crowd for many years. But again, for me, it's been startups for the past 10 years. And uh, it's gotten me all excited about technologies. So I feel like that early adopter that buys the tech first and tries it at home. And two years ago, or you know, more like one and a half years ago, I got a really snazzy computer and uh, Oculus Rift 3. And I've been using it every night, I have to say. So there's two billable hours a day gone when I'm killing robots with my hands. Now, it's got me all excited, but I underestimated the effects of next generation technology on our children. And one day when my three-year-old daughter was in the midst of just a normal tantrum, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be great if I showed her this new movie by Oculus Studios, which is a movie where you sit down in the middle of this house that belongs to a hedgehog, and uh, you see the hedgehog doing all these cute things. And I thought, this will calm my daughter down, for sure. Uh, obviously, you're not supposed to put her too much in front of the TV, and this was a bit extreme, but I thought this will solve this tantrum. So I put the headset on her, and immediately she was in. Now, at one point in this movie, like every children's movie, it's a five-minute movie, um, the main character has a breakdown. This hedgehog discovered that every time, it's more like a porcupine, every time he gets a friend and hugs that friend, the friend gets stabbed by his, uh, you know. So he realizes he has no friends. And at that point, my daughter took the headset off and began bawling her eyes out in a manner that got me in a complete panic. Because that was no longer the tantrum. That was pure sadness of an adult. And I felt like, whoa, this thing has completely immersed her into it. I had to really convince her to put the headset back on so that she sees the great ending where they get him a turtle friend with the uh, armor. Uh, sorry about the spoilers, by the way. Um, and, uh, and then she was in. And the thing is that she's talking about this hedgehog like every day, like it's her best friend. She's spent five minutes with the hedgehog in this world. I myself sometimes leave the robot killing games and join these chat groups where I also felt a little bit kind of hurt because when Oculus hands came in and people could start using their hands inside, you see how in these chat rooms, they go very quickly to just throwing objects at you. And it feels, it feels very, very vivid. Um, the fact of the matter is that as a lawyer representing entrepreneurs, you know that law is just not going to catch up with, um, with the pace at which technology is developing today. We're not going to be able to conduct summits uh, where we get to express an opinion about what the law should say about next generation technology. We're just going to have to deal with it based on very basic principles, high level macro principles. We're not going to have enough time to legislate. Uh, you know, you see ICOs today, just the issuance of a digital currency is just confusing everyone about what it is. And by the time that confusion will settle, and we'll have legislation, we might just have a huge market crash around this thing, or we might have the most nouveau riche, uh, the highest nouveau riche population the world has ever seen uh, dealing with new money. So I think it's fascinating, and uh, that's why I'm gonna be really interested in the panel that's going to discuss next gen tech, mutant children, and how they're going to destroy us, or how we get to prevent it. Um, we're probably already late talking about it. Um, but it's a great honor for me to, to be a part of this and for our firm, Yigal Arnon, to be a part of this. And now the person who's going to moderate this also has, is probably a better parent than I am. <laughs> but um, 
as, opposed, as, as it relates to Oculus Rift. Dana Mann has spent 12 years at VCs, JVP, our crowd, and has taken the great responsibility of uh, leading um, Alinovation. Alinovation, uh, Dana will tell you all about it, but uh, it's a center that is connected with the Alin Hospital that uh, rehabilitates children who are in very severe um, uh, in incapacitation and uh, brings them back to society. Al Innovation uh, takes the technologies from this hospital and uh, aims to build them into um, prosperous scaled activities that are available to the rest of the world. And Dana will be able to tell you more about that and present this uh, great panel and moderate it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nimrod. Um, very pleased to introduce the rest of the panelists. Uh, Professor Alon Peled. He is the chairperson of the Authority of Com Computers, Information and Communi Sorry. He is the chairperson of the Authority of Computers, Information and Communication of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He is a big data and open data researcher whose latest MIT press book, Traversing Digital Babel, Talk about great titles, right? Focused on some of his pan this panel's ethical challenges. Professor Pellet, will you join us? Yael Man Shachar has an academic background in psychology and organizational consulting. In recent years, she specialized in a field called the psychology of technology, trying to lead on a daily basis the digital nutrition revolution. It's also important to note that Yael Man Shachar and I, Dana Hochstein Mann, are not related. Chris Longo is Chief Operating Officer of Amtrust Financial Group, a multinational insurance group that has used technology to digitize its process and disrupt several large US markets. Chris? And it wouldn't be a panel in the future if I would only use written notes, right? <laughs> Dr. Morit Be'eri, Director General of Aline Hospital, is harnesses emerging technologies to the challenges to the challenge of treating children with disabilities and has coined the phrase from impossible limitations to unlimited possibilities, maintaining that environment and digital accessibility is more important than physical abilities in determining quality of life. Thank you all for joining us today. Yeah? <laughs> Within a quarter century, non-biological intelligence will match the range and subtlety of human intelligence. Anybody recognize this? F Notable futurist Ray Kurzweil explaining singularity, of course. We're going to get more neocortex, he says. We're going to be funnier. We're going to be better. We're going to be better at music. We're going to be sexier. We're really going to exemplify all the things that we value in humans to a greater degree. One more. Bill Gates recently told world leaders that bioterrorism, whether naturally occurring or manufactured by people, has the potential to kill more people than nuclear weapons. The next epidemic has a good chance of originating on a computer screen, he says, and adds that it could kill tens of millions of people, the post, so the Post reports. And then we have Microsoft Tie. Has anyone heard of Microsoft Tie? Raise your hand. Yeah, OK. So I think it was 2016 or 2017, something like that. Microsoft introduced a, um, what was it, an AI, an innocent AI, that's what they say, chat robot to Twitter. And they had to remove it in less than 24 hours. Why? Um, it transformed into an evil, Hitler-loving, incestual sex-promoting robot. This is because Ty's responses are learned by the conversations she has with real humans online. Lovely. This is a, a, one last quote by Juan Enriquez. He's a thought leader about what the changes in life sciences are going to do to business and politics and, and society. And he says, I think we're going to see a different species of hominid. I think we're going to move from, a homo, from Homo sapiens into Homo evolutus. 
Homo evolutus, a hominid that takes direct and deliberate control over the evolution of their species and others. And that, he says, would be the ultimate reboot, which I think is really cool. So this panel is going to focus on some of the moral and ethical dilemmas that face society as technology advances faster and faster. We've had some pretty fascinating conversations and prep for this panel, and I hope we're able to recreate them because they were um, very thought-provoking. So um, in 2006, the United States Department of Defense conducted a study to determine if military robots could be made um, to operate ethically. So the goal was to create a robot with an artificial conscience. Right? So think about situations with decision-making with children in the room and things like that. Um, and people say that robotic warfare may actually be more humane, as robots are probably less inclined to rape and pillage in the, out of rage or revenge, right? Um, Professor Ronald Arkin, he's an American roboticist and a roboethicist, he led the study and he said, my intention in designing this is that robots will make less mistakes, hopefully far less mistakes than humans do in the battlefield. Now, Professor Pellet, from your personal experience in the military, I know we're not quite there yet, at least not in Israel with robots replacing human soldiers, but from your experience, how is da data science already influencing decision making in combat situations? OK. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, I'll share with you um, an, an interesting observations, not from my um, academic background, but from actually from a military reserve duty. I'm an officer in a, um, in a very interesting capacity. And I've, been, I've served for 30 years in the IDF, beginning with the uh, first Lebanon war. And in 2014, on July, August 2014, I found myself uh, in a certain headquarters um, that was pretty much in charge of the, a good portion, like a really good portion of the fighting in Gaza as part of Operation Protective, uh, Protective, uh, Protective Edge, what we Israelis call Tsukaitan. And um, since I've been in the military for 30 years, and part of that time I've served in different headquarters, I had the, the privilege of observing both fighting and command technologies evolving and what people do with them. And I think one interesting observation I, I can, which I, think, I hope you'll find fascinating, but that's, again, that's a personal experience, is that actually um, uh, what you call killer robots are already here, that they don't have arms and legs, but when, you, when you're using drones or even what used to be old regular tanks or all kind of intelligence means, you are using a lot of robots, a lot of AI, a lot of data science, a lot of the things that you're dealing in this conference. And all that enormous amount of data has to merge somewhere and to be integrated and analyzed. And even that part of the data integration happens much faster for many more sources. A lot of these sources are much more accurate. And typically, as the name of our panel implies, right, killer robots and mutant children, typically people think, oh, we are going to put all of that new power into bad use. We're going to do a lot more killing. A lot of people will get hurt. My observation is exactly, my practical observation from the summer of 2014 is that exactly the, the opposite happens. In practice, what happens is that commanders in headquarters, thanks to these technologies, actually are gaining for the first time, probably the first time in, in, the, his, in, the, in the history of uh, military warfare, some, some privilege that they never had before. And that is time to think. In other words, where they were busy for all these thousands of years, having to deal with like survival of their troops, all of, it, all of a sudden, for the first time, they can actually ask a, a new set of questions. For example, questions that concern the well-being of the non-combatant across the line on the other side. And it was there. I was there. Now, it's not that we didn't care before, but we never had the luxury of dealing with this. When those allegedly killer robots are taking from us certain main, uh, uh, decisions and allow us to integrate data much faster, we're not necessarily becoming you know, more merciless and more killer. We're actually gaining time to think and reflect on a new set of moral dilemmas and, and even come up with some interesting solutions. So later on in your questions, if you want, I can provide some even concrete examples. Thank you. That's fascinating. Um, 
And to add to that, Yael, um, you know, you spoke to me earlier this week about research finding that there is less and less activity in the frontal cortex and that that's concerning. Um, can you tell, talk to us a little bit about what's happening there? In certain areas of the frontal cortex. Uh, can I ask them a question to, in order to answer to your question? Basically, I need to ask you, if, do you let yourself some absence time today in the digital world? Zman mit. Do you ever find yourself sitting, waiting for the doctor? And just sitting like this? No. And suppose some of you said yes, OK? There are also there's still some weird people out there. So um, what about you waiting for your Gmail to upload, and you see like the, the internet is a little bit slow, so you have that waiting sign, you know, that it's uploading the page. So are you waiting and looking at that sign, or are you waiting, opening a new page, checking your phone? You, get, you see where I'm heading with this, right? All of the above. What? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting and I'm checking my phone. So we don't let ourselves some absence time. It's perfect. It's a new world. It's great. But apparently, absence time is correlated with the frontal cortex. Here in the frontal cortex, we have something called the imagination area, creativity, and, uh, oh, well, there's more, but decision-making, those area become very much active when we are like that, just being in absent, but we don't let absent. So that area is working less. Now, forget about my research. Ask yourself, do you get good, good ideas in the shower? Do you ever get good ideas in the shower? You should, by the way. If you don't, it's a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, shower today is like the temple of the digital world. It's the only place when we, where we don't let digital in, and we actually find ourselves in absence time. So, in order to create more ideas and become better decision makers, we need ourselves, and especially the children. Children need to get bored. It's part of how the brain works. It's, how, it's part of how the brain develops. And that's what concerns us today, that uh, we don't see on the fMRI, we see scans that uh, prove that this area is less active. So rather than what Professor Pellet was saying, where it's enable us, that available space is enabling us to make new decisions and more decisions, you're saying it's actually not entirely full, being fulfilled, and we're actually losing brain capacity. Yeah, but the good news is, is, is actually it's not frightening. I agree with you. Um, once you hear that, you're supposed to understand what you need to do rather than what not to do. So if you create more absence time, like for, not, for example, you go to the toilet and you wait for someone to come out, you just let yourself be, you know, just let, hang in there, just watch the door, and there you have it, some absence time, and you'll see your brain goes back to um, being active. It's not like the brain is lost. That, no, it's, it, we're not there. We just need to balance up with the use of technology, and we're fine. That's what I think. That's great. I feel like driving would be that way also. Definitely. Now, to, um, to add a little bit to Nimrod's introduction, um, as he said, I'm the director of Alinovation. Okay, Alinovation is an innovation track at Alin Hospital. So full disclosure, we work together. I work with uh, Dr. Maurice Berry, where we develop and commercialize assistive technology for children with physical disabilities around the world. And um, Alin Hospital is a pediatric rehabilitation hospital. Now, I'm not plugging. I'm actually introducing the next question because I feel like potentially I joined Alina about a year ago, but maybe I don't have that long of a future to stay there because people talk about designer babies now, right? Parents, parents choosing the, what color eyes their babies will have or to what extent they'll be lactose intolerant. <laughs> um, are we facing a future and is, maybe, is there something wrong with the future where children won't be born with congenital conditions? I have absolutely nothing against the future with children without disabilities are born. Uh, children who are born with disabilities face a difficult life. Our, our work at Aline Hospital and in other similar institutions is to make this life a life full of quality and care and meaning. And the more technology advances means that the less we people actually need to use our physical body to, um, to reach our potential development in areas of 
thinking, developing digital information, accessibility technology means that we can reach everywhere even if we don't have legs, means that we can operate system even if we only have to use our eyes. So it's not as if I'm promoting disabilities. I don't think that it's a better way to live. You know, there's a whole new world where people with a hearing uh, impairment, they, they would kill me just for saying that, uh, think that this is an alternate way of being and not a disability. So disability means that you're not able to do the things that other children do. It doesn't mean that you're sick. It doesn't mean that you are in suffering. You, it doesn't mean that you're in pain. Our job is to prevent suffering, pain, and uh, discomfort so that these children can achieve whatever they need even if they don't have two perfect hands to work with. But I'd be absolutely wonderfully fine with children not being born with disabilities. However, we live in a complex world, and even if children are not born with disabilities, uh, most of us acquire some kind of disability throughout our life. I mean, it could be a sports injury, it could be a car accident, it could be just growing old. I mean, this is something that I wish all, all of you to achieve, growing old. And uh, we will all face physical limitations. And the question is, how can technology help us uh, make sure that these physical limitations don't translate into quality of life, life deterioration? And here we have huge opportunities now with this, these worlds that are opening before us. Can I ask a question? Interesting. I'm sitting next to an expert, so I just always I wonder two questions. Number one, what do you think about genetic therapies that are actually happening now? People that are actually signing off, going through uh, clinical trials. I have my opinion, but I want to hear yours because you sound very pro this. So, What's the fear, so to speak? So I think every new technology brings on fear. And I think history has proved that this fear is not unbased, but usually it's not directed in the right um, direction. So people were terrified when Gutenberg's Bible was first printed because knowledge is going to come out of the hands of the people with knowledge. And I, frankly, am terrified from this condition in which everybody here is in, not here. You're all experts. But everybody out there on the internet is just as much of an expert on children's disabilities as, as I am, because everybody has a better answer than I do. And the egalitarian way in which technology just um, flattens the world is, is scary more than anything else. So genetic therapy is just a technology that could be used in, for the greatest achievement of mankind could be misused, probably will make a lot of mistakes going down that road. Already we're using it. There are lots of children who, have, who are receiving therapies that are based on genetically modified viruses, that are based on drugs that are developed in that way. Just going further down that road, I think that uh, being scared of it is not going to help anybody. But, and regulations will always lag behind science and technology. They always run forward. Um, it's about having open discussions and keeping it out in the open uh, so that we can deal with the consequences. Last question. Uh, th thank you so much. No, that's, that's great. Um, what about extending life? So we, we've heard uh, even uh, one of the, the speeches the other day, uh, and, you know, as we continue to age, aging, the phenomenon of aging, we're making copies like on a photocopier. Every time we copy the cells, a little bit of degradation, and then we, we start to break down. What do you believe in, in repairing our, our code, so to speak, throughout lifetime and have treatments which will potentially extend our life beyond you know, 120 years when you, someone mentioned close to 1,000 years? What about the socioeconomic impact of having all of us around? For, he said that the first baby that's going to extend beyond has already been born. It's going to extend beyond the life of 125 years. Have you uh, thought of that or is that... Uh... Well, truth be told, I'm just thinking how far ahead I can be in Candy Crush um, by <laughs> 1,000 years. That's your downtime. That's good. Jeez. Exactly. So um, I don't really know. I'm, I'm more actually interested in, in better quality of life for the here and now than actually extending life to the point where... Um, um, we, we've now reached a point in, in medical advances where we're really good at advancing life and we're very bad at actually maintaining the quality of life. And, and economical issues come into that because if you only work 60 or 70 years and you still have to support yourself for the next 20, 30 years, who's going to carry that burden? And that's going to go on. And it's maybe belittling moral issues into numbers and figures, but it does all come down to that. It's about what do we do with this potential? And how do we make this life full of meaning? And are we going to fill it with, uh, I don't know, writing poetry and, and spending more time with our children and playing Candy Crush? Um, 
or are we going to spend it in hospitals with bed sores, uh, depending on machines to keep us alive without something to think about with our frontal cortex, which has been damaged by overuse of screen time? So. You know, Chris isn't just asking about um, extending life out of altruism. Chris is a capitalist. <laughs> You're a, he's a sci-fi fan, right? Sci-fi loving capitalist. I'm not a geek, so I don't hide it. I'm a nerd. Yes. Um, and Chris is in the world of insurance. So extending life has an impact. So Chris, what, how is AI impacting the world of insurance? Who's going to be out of a job in your industry? Well, there are already people out of the job in the industry. We specialize, I'm, I'm from Amtrust Financial, we're multinational. We really specialize in um, commercial insurance. So we're trying to insure small, medium-sized businesses. And um, insurance is an archaic process, just like banking was. So FinTech rushed in, started to automate, uh, that are still automating that process. And now it's set its sights on, uh, on insurance. Uh, our company has grown through using technology for disruption. We went uh, through 40 mergers and acquisitions. We developed technology to be able to merge uh, other companies' information onto our core platforms. Uh, massive expense savings using that, that process. But the unfortunate truth, and I'm not proud of it. I, am, I believe in capitalism, but I, I'm not. <laughs> my I didn't mean to come, offend. I'm a capitalist as well. My father would come smack me if I was too cold about it. But uh, uh, there are unfortunately many jobs lost through that automation. There are many manual jobs that are being performed by people that have been doing that for 20 or 30 years, just like manufacturing. We saw it happen in the steel industry. The Japanese came in and automated the process, produced better quality steel, cheaper in an automated fashion, and they crushed the American steel industry. My family, I'm from Pittsburgh, so I watched that industry die, and many of my family members are still impacted by that economically, and they had to pivot into other, as quickly as possible, pivot into other industries. Uh, medical technology industries uh, uh, are prevalent there. Uh, Ohio's the same way, it was impacted. I live in the Midwest, uh, the manufacturing area of the US. And uh, we were decimated, our jobs were decimated uh, by automation in industry. So I'm in financial services now, but you know, fast forward so many years later, it's the same process, the same unstoppable, insatiable process for, for more gains, you know, for a cheaper way to manufacture. Uh, so what we do is we do automate processes. Uh, we, do, we use AI in insurance. It's not as fun as some of the things we're talking about. Not fun or, in, I should say, interesting. Not fun, but it's not as interesting as some of the topics we're talking about, autonomous driving uh, or trying to uh, protect us through, through military action and save lives and, and medical technologies. So I feel kind of, I don't feel so cool up here in front of the experts. And I took a, a much longer time in college, but I don't have my doctorate. <laughs> I just enjoyed myself. So. <laughs> True story. You said you were a nerd. Uh, well, hey, okay. watching all those movies, playing all those games. Candy Crush wasn't around. We were still playing uh, Nintendo and Sony. But uh, so, but back to back to the impact on insurance. So the, the basic fundamental jobs, uh, the, the automated kind of the, the menial tasks, indexing documents, the shuffling documents around the basic logic around that has been automated, uh, highly automated. But now we're getting to the point where we have the wherewithal. With, uh, with very specific deep learning algorithms on very specific tasks, uh, like little threads of cognition, if you will, that are able to create a hive mind on decisions. And I'll give you an example. So uh, in claims, as you're adjudicating claims, we have, let's say we have 25 million situations, people injured, and we're dealing with the claims. There's a lot, of, a lot of information we're dealing with. You have to understand if someone hurts their back, their leg, what's the implications of that? What's, what region are they in? Which hospital are they in? Which treatment are they being given? Which pharmaceuticals are, they be, are, are being used? Which law firm is defending them? Which judge in the court system is being used? Whenever that judge works with that attorney, what's the outcomes? These are very complex problems. You never thought maybe insurance was that fun. I guess we're just big math shops that are good at, uh, at predict, do, we do our best to predict the future. So big data has been around in insurance. It's not a new thing. Um, but you take that information and one person's been working for 30 or 40 years they have an incredible insight. Wisdom. What's wisdom? Failing constantly throughout life and finding out how not to do it the wrong way. So you call that wisdom, this, this intelligence. So you give, you give one person, a, a, an experienced person, a specific problem to look at, and they have a solution based on their unique experience. Now, she has unique experiences, 30, 40 years in the industry as well. I give her the same problem. She may see a couple things differently. That's the beauty of human intuition. She may act a little differently. Same on, go on, so on, so forth. If you do that for a thousand people, if you can collect 
The actions, historically, over 15 years, over millions of transactions with the same problem, and have the collective reasoning of a thousand people, and incorporate that into an algorithm that encompasses that thought process for that very specific problem, you have an algorithm that decides much uh, more consistently than a human would, and you're able to boost the outcomes that you wish. And that, and you do that for every, and that's one, that's one problem. Now you apply that to, and, and by the way, once you do that, what does the, 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 the adjuster that spent 30, 40 years to learn how to do that process, their role and their, their value that they brought, their experiences, becomes diminished. So it's not just menial tasks that we're, that we're automating. We're, we're automating some actual create, part, part of the creative process we as humans. We now have the ability to encapsulate the creative process mathematically. And that's, that's frightening. So we're not just getting rid of uh, the, the low income. We're, we're, we're actually starting to affect high income earners. So look at in insurance, last thing, for, or at least for a second, we'll get back to interesting, uh, uh, other interesting things. But personal lines, so your personal automobile, automated prior to commercial insurance, as an example. And we used to have risk, uh, whenever they'd look at your risks, they would guess, you're a good person, I'll insure you. You're a good person, I'll charge you this. You're a good person, I'll charge you that. Personal automobile encapsulated those into algorithms, pricing algorithms, pricing and elasticity studies. And now we're used to have a floor, it's almost like trading floors in, stock, in, in the stock market. Uh, underwriting floors in insurance companies are gone. Uh, every, all of our documents have been digitized. There's no file rooms, there's no people pulling files anymore, everything's digitized. So decision-making departments are gone. And it's just following suit. It's going into claims adjudication. Then it's gonna go into, and then actuarial sciences. We're actually automating the actual process of creating these algorithms where they are learning on their own. You're automating the actual process of data science and then doing prescriptive algorithms and then actually changing on the fly. This is where we're going with our company and letting yes. them loose. I understand how you, this is all wonderful for the people who are working in your industry, but how's that impacting us? Are our premiums gonna go down? Yes, yeah, but for you it's, yeah, for the insurance worker, apps, I say that the first insurance person ever said your premiums will go down. But uh, I had this argument with my father, he hates insurance, so he doesn't know how I got sucked into it. It was a mistake actually. It happens to everyone in insurance. We don't mean to be in insurance, it just happens, seriously. The first day in insurance, when you see a new kid coming in, a smart, bright kid, you tell him, run. Run before they sink their teeth into you and suck your brains out and you're stuck here. But, um, sorry, but my father always says, Chris, I've been paying auto insurance for 10 years. I, you know, and I've never had an accident, thank God. Never had an accident. Why am I paying all this money? I, well, give me my money back. Why don't, I get it, why, why don't I get it back? And I said, well, Dad, I go, look down your street. I go, you see your neighbor down there? He's a little, you know, a little crazy. He doesn't drive so well. He has lots of accidents. He's paying the same amount as you. It's a socialist kind of, uh, we're spreading the risk out to everybody. So you're sharing and other people, if you're a responsible driver, way to go. Chris. Sorry. Are my premiums gonna go down? Yes. So, and the reason why is because what we're doing is tailoring insurance with these, we were only able to look at specific features. Whenever you're calculating risk or you're trying to predict the future and see how much you're gonna pay, we're gonna have to pay out in claims to you. We only had a few features and data points to go off, a very broad, high-level data. So I was classifying you into large, oh, you're a, you're a male between the ages of 25 to, to, to 40, so on and so forth. You have a oh, lot more a information job, now. College, you know, so very high-level information, your credit score is this. Now, I'm, we're going more towards usage-based insurance. So what we're gonna do is tailor insurance solutions for you. So we will, you see this with uh, usage-based driving. So it, it's common now where you have a little dongle that plugs into your car or your smartphone's tracking your driving behaviors. Do you brake too fast, go too slow? You, and we're learning how you drive. So you have very tailored, very specific, very personalized insurance to you. So if you're a responsible citizen and you're, you're, you're risk averse, you're not gonna pay as much as uh, the wackadoo down the street that's crazy. So if you night. have a kid, if you have a kid who's diagnosed with discordant disorder, uh, developmental disorder, which means being clumsy, but you have a scale for that. And that goes on his file when he's five years old, and that goes into his medical file, and he reaches driving age, will he pay more insurance then yes. because, yeah. Yes, because that's the reality. It's just, it's a math problem. It's, it's, we're just a financing arm of the, of the world, right? And then that's that pre-existing conditions. That's the problem with health care. And the family with the kid with disability, they will pay more health insurance. Or if you have cancer, you don't have insurance, how do you go get insurance so that your family's uh, wealth's not decimated trying to help you? I, 
I'm not in health insurance, <laughs> so that'll be, that's my parachute out of this conversation. Thank you, Chris. That was very interesting. In a few years, we'll take a look at my, my premiums. But you, you actually said something before about um, Dr. Bolitz, not Bolitz, not Dr. Berry's knowledge, and there's a distinction between information and knowledge. I'm not quite sure how data science refers to that, but you know, we, we know that knowledge is power, right? Is, is more knowledge, is more information, is big data superpower, or is it about to lose its value? Um, Peter Diamantes, the founder of the XPRIZE Foundation, uh, talks about meta-intelligence, a future in which everyone's highly connected brain to brain, right? Sharing thoughts and knowledge, sharing actions. And um, I'm wondering if knowledge is about to become a free resource, sort of like Wi-Fi. Um, how do we even handle having access to this massive amount of information and or knowledge? Is, is data science preparing that, preparing us for that kind of future? Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Uh, let's start with the bottom line. Knowledge is absolutely not going to be free like Wi-Fi. It's going to become good knowledge is going to be, and good information. It's going to become a lot more expensive. Um, in 1985, one of the kahunas of the information age, Stuart Brand in Menlo Park, said a sentence. And for some reason, the entire humanity remembers only the first half of the sentence. Stuart Brand said, information wants to be free. And then he said the other half of the sentence. And everybody forgot the other half of the sentence. And so the complete sentence from Stuart Brand, it's kind of like a, a mentor to Steve Jobs, was in, that the entire information age is going to be defined by a, struggle by a struggle between information wants to be free and information wants to be expensive. Just conveniently, we forgot the other part of the sentence. Now, all organizations, public, private, and non-profit and, and, um, non organization today, are defined by the information ha assets they hold. And you take away from the, the Treasury, the, uh, the budget book, or the Ministry of Interior, the Registry of the Population, and there is no ministry. I mean, it's not really about having desks or buildings. It's about the information they own. Are they going to release it for free, even if we could have overcome some of the ethical problems? No way. It defines the very organization, those information assets. I think the interesting story here is about the relationship between open data, that's the revolution that uh, President Obama started, former President Obama started in, uh, on May 21st, 2009, which is kind of information wants to be free, and what's happening in the real world and all this bartering, information for information, information for money, knowledge, and so on and so forth. I think that um, the real game for organization, and it's a tough game, and they're only beginning to play it, is to find the demarcating lines between what information they own that they can free on the web, and what information they own, which they should do exactly the opposite, which is means finding the clients, finding people who are interested in, in this information. The information that is released on the web for free is not bad information. Often it has very bad metadata to define that describes it. It's good information, but it's only a very, very small part of the information that very large organizations own. You need to be fairly sophisticated of, or have um, uh, certain types of help to basically si siphon through this information and make value out of it. The majority of the information that organization owned is closed data. It's not opened. It the, defines the very organization. And the, pretty much the bottom line of all these organizations is based on that. Thank you. Do you see, um, I mean, what's the relationship between data science and I guess maybe cybersecurity, right? So this increase in flow of information and knowledge in new ways and in different ways and soon from, again, brain to brain, what's the relationship between the, uh, the technology side of data science and cybersecurity about how to protect the data and maybe enable more, uh, more control, less control, um, controlling the levels of control that com companies have, governments have, societies have, that's probably going to have a huge impact on the difference between societies and first world and developing countries, et cetera. That's a very good question. I'll just, if, if you might find the following observation interesting. Usually when we say big data and data science, and they go often together for good reasons, we, um, we, we think about threats and oh, what's gonna to happen to my privacy 
and what's going to happen to uh, big, big Brother government and so on and so forth. And very few people actually raise their hands, and I'm one of them in that recent book there and said, wait a second, that new brave age of big data and data science for the first time in history actually empowers us to introduce the whole new generation of data privacy protections that were never available before. Let me give you an example. In, this, in Estonia and Sweden today, if someone in the Ministry of Housing touches your file, you get an email. Now, if you applied for a mortgage, then you know, that makes sense, right? Great, something about my application is moving. Someone is checking. If you don't have any business with the housing and you bought your last house 15 years ago and you're happy, why is someone in the Ministry of Housing touching my file? Now, you could have never afforded that kind of data privacy protection mechanism in the old paper-based world. You didn't have that thick and rich metadata layer. Metadata is data that describes other data. You never had it before, so you couldn't even develop that level of data privacy protection. So my point, and I'll say it again probably a couple of times, is like there's nothing really inherently bad in data science or BI or, or, or in big data. It's a lot about how we use them. It's just, it goes back to the questions we started with. If we put more sophisticated data science at the hand of officers in the battlefield, they're not necessarily going to do bad things without it. They actually can, for the first time in history, think more about the well-being of the non-combatant on the other side. You understand what I mean? It's the same thing. So there's, the question is really, what are you going to do with that stuff? And I'm actually hopelessly optimistic. When I'm, I'm finding a lot of good examples of people doing very decent and very moral and ethical things when they have more data science tools at their hands. Can, can I add a positive, not a Please. negative, to that? And it's along the lines of medical uh, techno, medical field. So uh, using, using data science, an, another huge advantage, uh, aside from security, is just, um, let's say, I, there's a great story. I think it's a success story where uh, there's a new data science tool that came out. It's Israeli, uh, some of the best stuff I've ever seen. It, this, this piece of software blew my mind, and we've seen so much tech in the last several years. So uh, a great story. They, they were in town. The gentleman was giving a lecture, and uh, there was a, uh, a specialist, I think the Switzerland, chief medical officer of Switzerland, I believe, and she had, uh, this doctor had been uh, spearheading a research uh, project for seven years Tons of money, tons of big pharma companies, clinical trials, trying to identify early indicators for colon cancer, uh, for a screening uh, technology. And uh, she heard a speech and was intrigued by the data science techniques and, and how they can actually pull together insights from the data. And she, uh, con she, she got together, uh, contacted them and said, hey, I have to fly in a few hours. Can you stop by? I have a massive amount of data with me from our research. I brought it along with me. It's on a thumb drive. Could uh, could I please come by and maybe we can perform a little uh, analysis on this? And the gentleman said, it doesn't quite work that way. There's a little bit more setup time. But he said, come on by, let's see what we do. So the gentleman put the unstructured data in, some structured, some unstructured data in, into his uh, model. Uh, and within one hour, it gave hypotheses for what the computer, given all of the criteria that it sees, all the data, all the correlations that it made that a human being cannot do across a multitude of data sets in a lifetime, or even capable of doing. And in 40 minutes, he put a stack rank list of what the computer guessed were the biggest causes or the best likely chance of I indicating early uh, colon cancer. And the doctor looked at it and, and was like, okay, that's strange, just a coincidence. And then she stopped a few down and went, oh my God, how did you know that? And what the algorithm did is it identified a protein, uh, a, a protein marker on a specific cell that was an indicator that, that was correlated to, and, 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 and he said, why are you interested in that? And she said, that marker took us six years of research, and I don't want to tell you how much money, to identify as a probable you know, uh, uh, success uh, to this project, and you just found it in 40 minutes. And so an op there's a, a tremendous amount of good that could come from this, not losing jobs, not doing terrible things in the military field, but the insights that we can have to improve quality of life, honestly, is, is compelling. There's so much good that can come from this if used by the right people and for the right purposes. It all boils down to that at the end of the day, how we end up using technology, I think. Um, and thank you for taking us back to health. You know, you can't really have a panel on morals and ethics and technology these days without talking about the big dilemma of the autonomous car, right? If it, when the car is faced with a situation where it can either uh, save its owner's life, say the owner is the sole person in the car, and the car has to decide how to behave on the street, either it saves 
its owner's life and sacrifices a car nearby, maybe a car with a family, a bus full of school children, right? Or does it sacrifice its owner's life and saves more people or children, right? It's this question. Now, um, what interests me in the context of this panel in this question is not what's the right answer, but who should be making this decision? What's the right answer? Who should be deciding what, what the car should decide? Who should be deciding how to program the car? Is it Elon Musk? Or is it um, the car owner, maybe? Every car decides for himself, him or herself. Is it the chief rabbinate when you come to Israel? And these types of dilemmas aren't just, aren't introduced to society with the autonomous car. Every year there's a committee in Israel, and I assume in other countries as well, that gets together to decide which medications and which, tre which treatments will be included in the uh, healthcare system that uh, the citizens receive and which won't. These are not decisions to, um, these are not easy decisions to make. And I know Dr. Beire, you have sort of, I don't think you sit on the committee, but you are close to it and know how that works. And you have some insights on that. What are your thoughts on who should be making this decision? How to program the autonomous car? So not me. Really, I do not want to sit on this committee. It's, it's impossible. These decisions, there are, there's no right and wrong. When people are in need and people are in pain, for them, their cause is the leading cause. And what we do see is that um, the more people have the public eye and they're more visible and they can, they can um, kind of show you their pain, they have more chances of actually um, receiving this... this um, um, the, um, the money that they need. And I think this is one of the conditions in which big data and insurance should really play more of a role. I know it's maybe taking a step back from the moral issues, but when I look at the last decisions that are made now, I treat a lot of children with muscular diseases, and I am, um, I think um, my work for them stands um, to protect me from what I'm about to say. So this year, the Ministry of Health has put into the health basket, that's what it's called in Israel, a drug that will benefit about 60 to 80 people um, at the cost of three or four other drugs that would have benefited so many more people because pictures of sick children in wheelchairs are more appealing than older people. And I think I stand behind, behind this, this thing because there's no... Uh, research behind this decision. There's no good data behind this decision. This is a decision that is based on hope and charity and and um, sense of, of uh, doing good. I don't think this is how decisions on a large scale should be made. And I'm actually looking forward to the time where we can actually put more data into our computers and come out with at least some decision trees that we'll be able to follow um, more um, I would say in a more balanced way. Morita, no, one sentence. The autonomous car decision. We talked in our, about this, about the government controlling information, uh, the difference between a nanny state and anarchy. So in one sentence, in your view, is it the car owner? Is it the government? Well, probably it will end up being the user themselves. Who should be making it will, decisions? It will go back to the user themselves that will make those decisions. I mean, those will be open and people will regulate and decide whether they want this to be pay cheaper for a car and take that risk on themselves or maybe um, have somebody else take the risk on themselves. I think this is something that the market will decide down the road. I don't think that anybody will be sitting and morally deciding who's going to take the blame for that kind Thank of you. decision. Thank you. One last question. Um, Yael? We can't end this panel without hearing from you about, what was it, the digital nutrition revolution? Hi. Uh, just for the last sentence to sum up this conversation about where technology is taking us, my personal opinion, just like yours, to a very good place. It's, we need to look at this whole technology revolution the same way we did with nutrition. Uh, it's not the same thing, but it's, the core idea is the same. We took a nutrition into our life and we start uh, consuming sugar like crazy and we were not sure what's good or not good to give children. Now we know. Now we go to the supermarket and we raise the product and we have everything written down and we are aware. We need to do the same thing with technology. We need to know where is the tipping point, where is that uh, gold point where too much of media, so social media is for... Well, how much is social media is bad for children after two and a half hours, give or take? 
until the age of 14. We have the information. Now you, the crowd, and us, we need to consume it, and then we're gonna enjoy the next generation, the next uh, developing technology like we should. That's, this is what I call nutrition of technology. Here, here. Thank you for that. Um, in, in closing, a few days ago on January 22nd, um, an author named Ursula K. Le Guin passed away at the age of 89. And Dr. Berry um, pointed this out to me and suggested that this panel would be a nice way, opportunity to pay a tribute to her because she was named by the New York Times in 2016 the greatest living science fiction writer. She wrote the Earth Sea Fantasy, among others. Uh, she was also a poet of the Earth Sea Fantasy series, The Left Hand of Darkness, The Dispossessed, The Telling. Um, and I thought I would close with this uh, quote of hers, which isn't in a novel, but she actually said it on a panel. Um, she said, in reading a novel, any novel, we have to know perfectly well that the whole thing is nonsense. And then while reading, believe every word of it. Finally, when we're done with it, we may find, if it's a good novel, that we're a bit different from what we were before we read it, that we have been changed a little, as if by having met a new face, crossed the street we never crossed before. It's very hard to say just what we learned, how we were changed. So I hope you learned something and that maybe you were changed a little by this panel. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference.